Oh, good morning, friends, brothers, and sisters. Good to be back among you. As I always say after a road trip, I am a homebody. I want to be at my house, on my porch, but more importantly, I want to be with my, with my family, oh God. It's a long, lonely road out there. Good to be back. We were doing the um, first uh, epistle of Peter when I left, and uh, in the meantime, I think we've watched a couple of sermons on those passages, if I'm not mistaken. So I'm going to go ahead and pick right up where we left off in 1 Peter chapter 2. So if you would turn there in your Bibles, please, while I ask the Lord's blessing on our time together, I would appreciate it. Lord, thank you for the chance to remember your gospel today as we read it in your word. I pray that you would shout it to us, shout it to our hearts. Lord, we come today, as we always do, burdened with anxiety and fear and pain and suffering, isolation and loneliness, all of the things that this uh, mortal flesh is heir to. And I pray, Lord, that you would um, speak your gospel to our hearts and that your father love for us would be a salve to those wounds. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 So um, 1 Peter chapter 2 is where we were, and the last time I spoke, uh, we looked at verses 1 through 3, which I want to read uh, to you again by way of context. Peter says, So put away all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander. Like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk, that by it you may grow up into salvation, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. We talked last time about how the specific warnings and condemnations and prohibitions against sins of the flesh are great reminders for us to uh, look back into the gospel and to follow Peter's advice from earlier in the letter where he says, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you on the day of Jesus Christ. As he who called you is holy, be holy in all your conduct. Remember, we've been putting that in the context of, remember the gospel. Live in your time in exile here from your citizenship in heaven, from your membership in the family of God. And in all your conduct, be holy. In all your conduct, be a son or daughter of God. Live from the freedom that has been bought for you by the blood of Christ. And that's an easy enough thing to, to grasp onto, theoretically, theologically. But when, it, when the rubber really meets the road is when Peter follows it up and says, oh, by the way, that malicious tendency in your heart, malice, envy, slander, hypocrisy, those things as they flower in your heart are reminders that we need to turn back to our citizenship in heaven. They're occasions for remembering that we are sojourners and exiles here and that our flesh is constantly at war with our spirit. And so we want to embrace the lists of prohibitions as we find them in the New Testament. It's opportunities to, as it were, be saved again by the free grace of God. So that's where we were last time. But then Peter changes the subject a little bit, and I want to read the passage for today uh, and try and put it in its conduct, uh, context. Uh, starting in verse 4 of chapter 2, he says, As you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in scripture, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone, chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe. But for those who do not believe, quote, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, and, quote, a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. The word of the Lord from 1 Peter chapter 2. Doesn't that seem like a change of subject to you? Beware all malice, hypocrisy, slander, and envy. Crave the spiritual milk of the gospel. 
Remember in your own personal heart how you are a citizen of the heavenly kingdom and how you are a recipient of his grace. And then all of a sudden, a big long passage about how God's plan is to build up a church of living stones, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a chosen people. He goes from the very personal to the very corporate. We hear that the Lord has a plan for something, a large, historical, worldwide plan to build himself a temple. It's slow, this plan. It's invisible, maybe even. The reason I think that is because he quotes the passage where he says, whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. Being put to shame is risk being involved in this building project. It might turn out that we put our faith in something, that we invested in something that didn't turn out. We have to be assured, we're reassured that it's going to be okay in the end, that the plan is going to come to pass. It's invisible. It's long-term. Maybe counter-cultural. Maybe counter-intuitive. I want to put this large plan into its context and encourage you with the gospel today. Because the gist of the passage is this. The Lord has it as one of his highest priorities to knit us together as living stones and to salve that wound that's in your heart of isolation and loneliness and alienation. The Lord has a plan to take each one of you sinners that struggle with malice and slander and envy and all the passions of the flesh and not only forgive you of your sin, but solve the problem that leads your flesh into all those errant ways. That desire, that deep desire for belonging, that deep desire to be numbered in a family, to have a name and people that go by that name as well. This is the thing we all struggle with down at the bottom. And the way the Lord has designed to solve this problem is to put us in church together to build us up as living stones into a house for his name, to make us priests and worshipers in his family and in his congregation. Now, there's two ways to respond to that that we often do. One of them is, well, he certainly doesn't seem to be doing it very quickly <laughs> or very well. I still feel isolated and burdened. I still feel on the outside looking in. I still feel like the relationships that are supposed to be salving that wound are slow in coming. The other response is, why would I want to be involved in something like that? I've been around long enough to know that the church is unsafe. That the church is just like all other clubs. It's filled with relationships of people that are untrustworthy. It's filled with relationships that end up being predatory in the end, and I'd rather live alone. We, we respond to this idea that the church is the answer for us in the mind and plan of God by saying, oh yeah, when? Or, no thanks. How many times have you heard, I like God, fine, it's his people I can't stand. <laughs> right? Getting along with folks is actually more trouble than it's worth. Or going back to that other thing, yeah, I'd like to have people, but I don't fit. I don't belong. I'm excluded. I'm ignored. I'm pushed out. This is where we really live. So that the message that Peter's supposedly giving us as good news, don't worry, guys, there's a church for you to belong to, is not really good news at all. I want to suggest to you that part of the reason is that we assume the basis for our congregation to be the wrong one. The reason you'll hear out on the street is that the church is full of hypocrites. Is that people who say that don't understand what the church actually is. They assume that the church, among other things, is a gathering of the righteous. Right? The church is a gathering of the righteous where the entrance ticket into the door is good behavior or moral rectitude or having your stuff together. 
And that what we do when we walk in the door is we bask in our togetherness. Right? We bask in the way that we do it differently than the world. We bask in the ways that we are better than the world. And so no one really belongs. No one really is welcome across the threshold of the door. Because down deep in our hearts, we realize that we don't really qualify to belong to this group that has these characteristics we imagine. The person on the street that says the church is full of hypocrites is saying something true in the wrong words. What he's saying is, I've noticed that the church is full of sinners. And he assumes that that's a, that's a judgment against the church, right? I've, I've noticed something that none of you people inside have noticed. The church is full of sinners. And so I can stand in judgment on you all because you're clearly telling a lie about yourselves. You're saying we're not sinners, but I know you are. And so I shut my mind and turn my back on all of you. And this would be a spurious accusation if it weren't true. Nine times out of ten, we inside the church do long to be not sinners. We do act as though we're not sinners. We're susceptible to the charge of hypocrisy. This might be why Peter says in the first few verses before today's passage, put away all hypocrisy. What does that mean in the context of this overarching plan of God to build something eternal in the world? Don't you think it's strange that he weaves this big statement of God's giant theological plan in between two passages about passions of the flesh? I've read you the one that comes before it already, right? Put away all malice and deceit and hypocrisy and envy and slander. Look what comes right after it. Look down in chapter 2, verse 13. Sorry, verse 11. Right after he says, You have been made a people. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. He goes on to say this, Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. He goes right back to the theme he was on before he went off on this tangent about the, the spiritual living stones being built together into a house. Right back to be aware, beware the passions of the flesh. Abstain from the passions of the flesh. He's going to go into even more detail in the passages that follow about submission to authority. Wives and husbands getting along together. What is it about this description of the church that is connected, interwoven with this, these warnings against the passions of the flesh? Suppose you're already to the point where you say, I realize that my urge to resist the plan of God for the church is due to my own weakness. Maybe you realize that, and you're willing to go along with me for argument's sake. Participation in the church might be what I need. How does it relate to Peter's warning against malice and slander and hypocrisy, to Peter's charge to abstain from the passions of the flesh? What's the connection there? I think it has something to do with that charge from the guy on the street that we're all hypocrites. It has something to do with the fundamental misunderstanding about the gathered people of God that's carried around in the minds of hearts of those outside. That fundamental misunderstanding that says the church is supposed to be full of righteous people and instead it's full of sinners. I want to just say something just very straightforward, hopefully very simply and very shortly. Peter's message in this section is that the church is full of sinners and that our identity as members of his family and members of his body comes directly from our identity of, as those who need to be reminded about malice and slander and hypocrisy, who need to be exhorted and warned to abstain from the passions of the flesh. The reason I think that is at the beginning of the passage for today. Turn back to chapter 2, verse 4. In describing this process by which individual people are built up as living stones into a church, he says, As you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, 
are being built up as a spiritual house. How are we being built up as a spiritual house? When are we being built up as a spiritual house? By what technique or sequence of events are we being built up as a spiritual house? As we come to him. Let's talk about that for just a minute. What does it mean? What does Peter mean when he says, as you come to him, you are being built up as a spiritual house? Does it mean as you gather across the threshold and worship? I mean, that's that could be, it's very obvious, right? As you come to him, as you come in his doors, as you come into the door of his physical house, you are being built up into a spiritual house, right? That's a logical way to interpret this. The spiritual unseen house of God is built as the physical seen people of God gather together. Could be. Maybe that is the correct reading, but I want to suggest a different one for purposes of focusing our attention on the gospel, focusing our attention on what I think is at the heart of Peter's message. I think coming to him, the living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious, has to do with putting away all malice and deceit and hypocrisy and envy and slander. I think coming to him in the sense that Peter is describing has to do with abstaining from the passage of the flesh, passions of the flesh, excuse me, which wage war against your soul. I think coming to him in the sense that Peter's describing has to do with setting our hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ and being holy in all your conduct since it is written, you shall be holy for I am holy. I think what it means to come to him in this way is to declare of yourself that you need the mercy of God. To declare, I am in need of grace and salvation and mercy. We say it all the time, and it just there's just no real reason to change the subject. One of the reasons that you have been born into a fleshly body and live in this world, as we've been saying, of cliques and tanks and IRAs, is so that you can be reminded on a regular daily basis where your true hope lies and where your true citizenship is. And the more specific we can get with those occasions, the better. I wanted to be very specific last time we spoke about the dangers of malice and envy and hypocrisy and slander. Peter starts with those things. We should consider them to be important. I wonder if anybody since we spoke about that has seen malice and envy and hypocrisy and slander sprouting up in your own heart or noticed it where you hadn't noticed it before. I want to do the same thing today. Let's keep let's stay on that theme for a minute. He's going to get specific about other stuff next week. But I want you to think about your own tendency to malice and hypocrisy and slander and envy today in the context of the Lord building a temple for his name. How can those two things possibly go together? How can Peter say, the Lord is building a temple for his name, so watch out for slander, malice, hypocrisy, and envy? Well, there's two possible ways to think about it. The Lord's going to build a temple for his name, and he can't have any malicious people in it. So get that stuff out, or else you're not going to be a living stone. Or, what's the gospel way to look at that? The Lord is building a temple for his name, in which he gets all glory for all salvation and all redemption and all cleansing. So come confessing your slander and malice and hypocrisy and envy. And let the Lord deliver you and redeem you and wash you in his blood. So that as you enter and become living stones in his temple, you proclaim with one voice the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And say with full hearts, because you've been delivered from malice and hypocrisy and slander and envy, we were not a people, but now we are a people. We hadn't received mercy, but now we have. Who is it that receives mercy? Look at verse, verse 10. You are now God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. 
Who's he talking to? What is he saying about them? He could be talking to his first century readers. They could be Jews or Gentiles. There's, the opinion is divided. I want to say that Peter's talking to you and me, Christ Reformed Church in Abbey, Washington in 2022, and saying this of us, once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. How is that? It's that once you hadn't been confronted and convicted of your malice hypocrisy and slander and envy and now you have and you have gone to the Lord with it and you have received what he is faithful to deliver every time and that is forgiveness and acceptance and identity for all the malicious slanderous hypocritical children in his family. You have received mercy. If we are a gathered group of the righteous who are known by our perfections, we cannot also be the people of God who have received mercy. And this is one of the great reasons why Peter and Paul and all the writers in the New Testament lean so hard on Christian morality. There are other reasons which we'll get to, but the main one is this. Only the saved from sin are sure of their identity as children of God. From my own experience, take it from me if you don't have this in your own experience. Those of us who know no sin in our own hearts do not need the love of God the Father. Our own self-love is plenty. We are full up with self-love and self-congratulation and self-sufficiency. It's only when the law, as it is expressed in these wonderful letters, comes in and kills us that we become candidates for the great mercy of God our Father. Hypocritical! Oh no, I didn't know that! I didn't see that about myself till right now. Envious, slanderous, angry, murdering, thieving, debauched, sensual, dishonest. God have mercy. To which the Holy Spirit always replies, that is the right cry. Welcome to the family of God is composed only of his sinful, wayward children, dependent every moment on his grace. It is of these kind of stones that the Lord is building the house for his name. So I want to encourage you today that you belong, you are living stones to the degree that you come to him, like verse 4 says. To the degree, degree that you come to him, the living stone himself, you are living stones yourself. And let me just take this from the other angle. To the degree that you are outside the family of God, to the degree that you feel excluded and isolated and not a part of what he is doing corporately in the world, it's the degree to which you are not coming to him. You have not come to him in this sense. Because membership in this physical, gathered temple of living stones is an automatic thing. I think that's what verse 4 and 5 tell us. Let me just read it one more time. As you come to him, a living stone, as you come to Jesus in dependence, receiving all that he has for you, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house. These, are, these two things happen simultaneously. And so we can conclude that if we are not, in our own experience, being built up as a spiritual house, if we're on the outside looking in, if we're isolated and alone, then one of the things going on is that we are not coming to him, the living stone, 
rejected by men, but in God's sight chosen and precious. One of the things that we are not doing today is walking in full knowledge of our need, in full knowledge of our envy and hypocrisy and slander and wrath. Is Peter down about this? Is Peter saying, look, you guys need to learn something that you don't know about yourselves, and I'm a really burden for you, and uh, it's not going well. The guy on the street, the, the accuser on the street accusing you of hypocrisy, he's got a point. The future is bleak. Not at all. Not at all. Let me read the last few verses again. But you are a chosen race. You are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. This is like he's doing in chapter 1. Remember in chapter 1? He says, um, in your hearts, though you have not seen him, though you struggle in this world of grief and suffering and deprivation, you rejoice. Remember, we've said this over and over again. Peter is not saying, I wish you would rejoice. He's not saying, don't forget to rejoice. He's declaring that your spirit, as a child of God, rejoices in the gospel. He's also in a similar way declaring to you today that you belong to his house his temple. You are a living stone. Your experience of that may fluctuate day by day as you look around and say, I'm not connected to anything. I'm a dead cold stone. Maybe there's a spiritual house being built, but it's being built somewhere else with other pieces. Peter says, no, that's not true, actually. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. Want to be reminded? Lean into the law of God. Lean into the opportunities it provides for confession and repentance and reconciliation. Lean into the need you have for the blood of Jesus to cover your sin. I think that's why Peter weaves this picture of the church in and amongst these warnings and prohibitions against the sins of the flesh. They're two sides of the same coin. I would even say maybe they're closer, even more closely entwined than that. Two ways of saying the same thing. The Lord's building his house among us and with us and through us in the very walking through pain and sin and suffering that we experience every day. So what does it look like? What's, what can we expect it to look like? One of the things I think we can expect it to look like is the kind of prayer for each other that we get to participate in on a regular basis here. And the way that we manage to bear each other's burdens. The way that we manage to look at the pain and suffering of the person next to us and carry it for a moment when we gather together. Those are such encouraging hints of what's going on at the spiritual level. But I want to remind you that there's a way in which those are physical symbols and manifestations only. The prayers of the saints are auditory. They happen as the vibration of the larynx and the formation of the teeth and tongue and lips. They're very physical. But they testify to something at the spiritual level that's true and real and permanent. And that is that you and me, my brothers and sisters, are being built together into a house for his name. And what is the long term? I was, I was asking a second ago, what can we expect this to look like in the end? can we expect that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light here's what you can expect as you continue to participate in the building of the living house of God you can expect to be called and drawn ever more on a daily basis out of darkness and into light. You can expect in the long run for those warnings against the sins of the flesh, for those exhortations to abstain, you can expect those to characterize you more and more as time goes on. You can expect to look back and say, I have been drawn and called out of darkness into light. Praise God, I have received mercy. And to be more and more, as time goes on, one of a throng of brothers and sisters who lives to proclaim that glorious gospel. 
it should be an encouraging thing to remember. To see the hypocrisy, the slander, and the envy in your heart. To say, oh, the Lord, having revealed that to me, the Lord convinces me that I am one of his chosen ones. That I am on a path from darkness to light. And that this actually, this revelation about myself is evidence to me. That he's making me into a living stone. Fit to be joined together with all the other ones. That on the surface don't have anything in common with me. That on the surface seem like they belong to another house altogether. It's not true. It's not true. Hypocrisy and envy and slander unite us. The sins of the flesh unite us. We all have the same opportunities to depend daily on the free grace of God. May he make that real to our hearts as we go forward into this world of clicks and votes and tanks. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Lord, I do pray that you would unite us together, that you would, as we come to you in repentance, as we come to you in need for mercy and grace, that you would build us together as living stones into a house for your name. Lord, I pray that you would do it more quickly than we, than we see it happening now so that we could be comforted. I pray that you would turn our hearts to that project of yours so that we could rejoice when we see it done. I pray, Lord, that your gospel would inform our thoughts about ourselves and our thoughts about our neighbors. Help us to see common ground between us in the very sins that you have your apostles call out and in the mercy that comes in response to repentance. Lord, work your work in all our hearts, we pray in Jesus' name.